Here's a question for you. Why do we get fat? As Americans, we've gotten heavier and heavier over the past century, and disease rates have skyrocketed. And there's many theories for this. We're eating too much fat. We're eating too many carbs. We're eating in excess of sugar. So is it our lifestyle or our diet that's to blame? Or could there be a single common cause that explains the sharp increase in not only obesity, but conditions as disparate as heart disease, cancer, and dementia? My guest today reveals the surprising science behind why we gain weight and how we can prevent and reverse it. Hello and welcome to the Over 50 Health and Wellness Show. I'm your host, Kevin English. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach, and my mission is to help get you into the best shape of your life, no matter your age, so you can show up in the second half of life as the healthiest, strongest, most vital version of yourself. We have a great show for you today. Dr. Richard Johnson is here, and he's going to tell us why nature wants us to be fat and what we can do to fight back. But before we get to today's episode, I want to tell you about an exciting giveaway promotion that I'm running this week. I'm giving one lucky person six months of one-on-one -on -one personal training and nutrition coaching absolutely free. This is a $1,500 value and it can be yours at zero cost. All you need to do to enter is fill out a brief form telling me why you'd like to win. And in addition, I'll be offering five runners up a 50% off of this training package as well. The winner will be announced this Monday, March 21st, 2022. So if you're listening to this podcast before that date, it's not too late to apply. Probably the easiest way to enter is go to my private Facebook group called the Over 50 Lean Body Blueprint and apply there. But you could also shoot me an email at coach at silveredgefitness.com and I'll reply with a link to enter. And I'll drop all of that info into the show notes, which you can find over at silveredgefitness.com slash episode 111. Okay, enough of that. Let's get on with today's show. My guest today is Dr. Richard Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a professor of medicine at the University of Colorado and is a clinician, an educator, and a researcher. For more than 20 years, he has led research on the cause of obesity and diabetes with a special interest in the role of sugar, especially fructose. His research has been highly cited, published in top medical journals, and supported by grants from the National Institutes of Health. He's the author of The Sugar Fix and The Fat Switch, and his latest work is a book titled Nature Wants Us to Be Fat, and this book contains state-of-the-art discoveries on the cause of obesity as well as potential cures. I started our interview by asking Dr. Johnson how he got interested in medicine and eventually nutritional science. Well, originally I liked history and anthropology. I thought I was going to be an archaeologist. <laughs> But my father was in academic medicine and loved research and loved biology. And I liked biology, too. And he really uh, tried to persuade me to go into go to medical school. And after I went to medical school, I, I knew I wanted to be a professor and do research. And because although I love clinical care, I just too curious. I'm a really curious person when people would come in with their diseases I wanted to not only treat them, but I wanted to understand why they were getting their diseases. And so very early on, I got into research. I've been doing that for 25 plus years. And it started in the field of kidney disease because that was my specialty. But it took me out of, you know, I started studying high blood pressure. High blood pressure involves the kidney, but high blood pressure is also associated with obesity. And before I know it, I was really studying not just high blood pressure and kidney disease, but also obesity and diabetes. And I was always interested in the big questions. I really didn't want to know about how this hormone bound to this receptor. 
I wanted to really understand, you know, why are people getting obesity? Why are people getting diabetes? And that path took me into research that eventually took me into studies of animals in the wild, native hunter-gatherers, you know, studies in laboratory animals, of course. And But even I, I reconnected with my archaeology and evolution studies. And so our approach has been really quite a why we come in from multiple angles to try to solve the problem. Yeah. And I, I love how you talk about your curiosity driven and you wanted to know why, because I feel like that's one of the failing. I mean, let's not, let's, let's not throw modern medicine under the bus. It's done some amazing, amazing things, but a lot of, I guess, current medical practice is more of a treating of symptoms when it comes to things like you're talking about high blood pressure and obesity, et cetera, these uh, metabolic derangements, let's say, and less of a, hey, let's get to the root cause of this and yeah. quote unquote, cure that or fix that, right? So it sounds like maybe oh, your absolutely. curiosity. You know, when, yeah. when I go on the, you know, on the wards, when if a person comes in with coronary artery disease or heart disease, I mean, we have antiplatelet drugs. We have statins to lower cholesterol. We have blood pressure medicines. We have all these multiple diabetes medicines. We can put stents in their coronaries. We can do bypass surgery. We can even replace the heart. But, you know, all these are, are treating the damage. What we really want to know is why are you getting heart disease? Why are you getting obesity? Why are you getting diabetes? And all these conditions are so commonly connected to each other. So a person will come in and you can just rattle off 10 diseases that are all connected, diabetes, fatty liver, high blood pressure, kidney disease. And so there was, it was obvious that there's something driving this. And the Kevin, the, you know, so my history interest, you know, I, whenever I read about a disease, I go back in the literature to the farthest back you can go. The first reports and, you know, I mean, like obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure, they were rare in 1900. They were rare. One in 30 people were obese back then. You know, one in two, uh, one in 50,000 people had diabetes back then. I mean, that is like wow. ridiculous. Yeah. Today, you know, if you go to Samoa, 40% of the population are di of the adults are diabetic. So, I mean, it's just what happened. And why? And yeah, we can treat all these. God, we're good at treating diabetes now, but we're not good at preventing diabetes. And so what we need to do is to figure that out. And so that was, I, I was always where my focus was. What is the cause of these things? Yeah, that's interesting that you say we're good at treating these things, right? So our, our medical expenses are through the roof at historic yeah. highs and, and are rising all the time, but yet we're getting sicker with every yeah. day that passes, right? So why? <laughs> and that's the million dollar question. Why are, and you had mentioned that these things often come together, right? We're going to talk a lot about obesity, but it's obesity is often is very commonly associated with high blood pressure and type two diabetes. And what do we say? Uh, fatty liver disease, kidney disease, all these other cofactors, right? What's, what's yeah. going on? What, why was that a hundred years ago? not so prevalent. And now it's spreading like well, wildfire. Well, wildfire. The, 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 the world kind of went through the science scientists kind of went through some transitions there. So way back when, in like 1900, when, when these diseases were first being really recognized to becoming more common, they started increasing around 1900 by 1929 or so 1930, heart cardiologists were forming the, the American Cardiology Society. I mean, it was heart disease used to be so rare. There weren't really many cardiologists and because they didn't need to be. But, you know, so when, the, when they first started looking at this, actually there were these early reports that it was sugar. And when people, there was a, a study in 1905 when diabetes started to appear, they realized that it was linked with sugar intake. And there was a famous guy, the New York City Health Commissioner, who who really did this incredible study linking diabetes and obesity with sugar intake way, way back from about 1880 to 1920. And he, he, he really made a convincing case it was sugar. And even Frederick Banting, who discovered insulin, thought the cause of, of type 2 diabetes was sugar, refined sugar. 
But then around in the 1920s, there was a very famous physician based in Boston. And he said, hey, you know what? It's not sugar. People are just eating too much. They're exercising too little. And he coined the term overnutrition. And his name was Jocelyn of the Joss, famous Jocelyn Clinic these days. And, and it sort of made sense. I mean, a lot of people were eating a lot more food. Food was more available. Everyone was eating bigger plates. They were exercising less. Now they had cars. They had escalators and elevators. And so it made sense that if you eat too much and you exercise too little, it's a math. It's a simple math equation. It's, you know, too much in, too little out. It's going to, you're going to accumulate calories and it's going to accumulate as fat. So that was the leading thought for what caused obesity till like 1995 or 2000. And then there was a big breakthrough. There was a guy named Friedman and he, he, knocked out a gene in a mouse by, I think it was sort of by accident. And the mouse became hugely fat. And it was seemed like there's a gene that controls fat. And uh, this fat gene turned out to be leptin. And it, this is a hormone that's produced by fat cells. And when it goes up, it tells you that you're full. So you quit eating. So, so like if you're eating, you know, there's this kind of leptin signal to the brain says, okay, you've eaten enough. You don't need to eat anymore. And that's, that's it. So when, the, when he knocked it out, when there's no leptin, the animal continues to be hungry. And instead of regulating its weight, it just continues to eat more and more and more until it gets super fat. And, you know, there were these studies back then that showed that like animals in the wild, they regulate their weight really tightly. And if you force fed them, they would gain weight if you force fed them. But then if you stopped, they would go right back to their weight. If you, you know, fasted them, they would lose weight. And then if you stopped, they'd go back to their weight. So there was all this stuff suggesting that animals regulate weight. And there was even some studies in people way, way back when suggesting that we tend to regulate our weight. And, you know, certainly when you were young, it seems like it's hard to gain weight. You know, you can eat all the bad food, drink the soft drinks, and it seems like you're invincible. I think almost everybody has a period of time in their life when they think they're invincible. And then at some point, it changes with each person when they realize that there's something going on and they can gain weight easily. But anyway, the leptin became the recognition that there was a hormone that controlled your food intake. And then it was shown that people who are overweight tend not to respond to leptin very well. So they tend to be what we call leptin resistant. And that, that kind of opened up the idea that maybe it wasn't just uh, our choice that we were eating too much and exercising too little, but maybe we were actually persistently hungry. And the reason why people give you, we eat larger plates of food isn't because the restaurants are trying to entice us, but they don't want us to leave unhappy. You know? right. so, so they give you more food. And so this, it, there was kind of this shift from obesity being a behavioral disorder, which would be easy to correct, right? Just don't eat as much, exercise more. But that didn't really work long term very well. But if it's a biologic problem, you understand why it doesn't work, because your willpower can work for a while. But if there's a biology telling you you want to eat and there's a biology telling you to, to sit in the chair... That's harder to fight. So what happened is around 2000, we began to realize that it wasn't just a behavioral problem, that it was, there was a biology, there was something driving it. And our work got, we kind of got excited when we started realizing that animals will purposely gain fat at certain times of the year when they know they need to carry fat. So fat isn't always bad. Fat can be, you know, a source of calories. I mean, so if you don't have food and you're fat, you're going to live longer than if you don't have fat. So fat is, can be good and animals in the wild like that. So, you know, when they're preparing to hibernate, they'll suddenly double their weight or if they're going to nest, or if they're going to go on a long distance flight. So there are all these different things that animals do. And when we realized that what we realized is that it was like a switch that, you know, most of the summer, the animals tightly regulated, its weight's fine, it can eat more one day and less the next. 
And then something happens in the fall and suddenly they become voraciously hungry. They, the bear will suddenly gain eight to 10 pounds extra a day. Eight, wow. Ten. Yeah. Can you imagine a, gaining 10 pounds a day? Think that's how a lot, much. That's a lot of eating. Yeah. <laughs> they they uh, can eat 20,000 calories in one day. Wow. And they will increase their weight by 50%. So if you're a bear, think about how much weight that is in just a couple months. So, you you know, you think that we get into trouble. But imagine if you were eating that much. I mean, it's amazing. So these these animals will, will some of them will double their weight. Some animals are known to like double their weight, but they put on all this fat and then they use that fat to survive. So we were very interested, you know, what what's triggering that? And so, but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, well, no, I think that's fascinating. And, I, and obviously, given the the title of your book, I think we all see where you're going here. Your most recent book, but it's interesting that animals will self-select food. And I, I was looking at my bookshelf, and I don't see the book right there. But I recently read something that talks a lot about animals not only self-selecting the appropriate amount of calories for optimal health, but animals will self-select the appropriate macronutrient rate, uh, ratios for them, given their, where they are in their life cycle. So yeah. you know, young, young males that are need to reproduce are eating a whole bunch of protein and then later in their yeah, life. And they're, right. you know, so they're doing all these things, self-selecting, and we can infer that that's probably not driven by behavior the way we understand behavior, but rather this has got to be driven by biology, right? And I think that's yeah, where we're going that, here, right? That is so correct. And we can get into this. I don't know if I want to get into this too much right at this, but yeah, absolutely. Animals will pick if they need nitrogen, if they need protein, right. they will pick foods for that. And, and, and there's often kind of a timing that where the environment also kind of knows that, for example, that it's going to be a rough time for the animals. And there's this kind of symbiosis that goes on with animals and plants and so forth that um, maximizes benefits for both groups. It's, it's, it's probably evolutionary based. But anyway, so yeah, that's absolutely true. And so these animals then that are getting ready to, let's just take that bear, for example, right? He or she is going to go all spring and summer long, self-selecting foods and being at this, what we'll call this normal or healthy weight. And then they're going to do this tremendous feeding. And that's going to be also just because of the miracle of nature, right? It's just going to just so happen that the food is going to be abundant in order for them to take in this tremendous amount of excess food and store it as fat because they're going to have this long period where they're not going to be able to eat. And so you had started this whole conversation by saying, hey, there's this guy Friedman. He found this fat gene, leptin, and was deciding that, yeah. hey, maybe it's not so much our behavior or culture that's that's causing us to be fat, but it's maybe this hormonal dysregulation. Yeah. What's happening here? What's what's going on with these animals? Oh, I mean, like, yeah. Well, like for the bear, when it starts eating, it actually suddenly becomes resistant to leptin. And you can actually, so the way you show that is you inject an animal with leptin. If I inject an animal with leptin, remember it causes a sense of fullness. It will immediately reduce the amount of food it eats at the very next meal. So in the next, within that first 24 hours of getting the leptin, an animal will cut back its food intake by 50%. But if you're resistant to leptin, it'll eat just like it normally does. It won't reduce its food intake at all. And that's been done in bears. They've actually injected them with leptin in the fall, and they become resistant to leptin. So it's very similar to what we see with people. Here's another uh, really exciting thing, Kevin. You know, these animals, when, they, when they're preparing for hibernation or when they just go into hibernation, some of them will actually become most of them will become insulin resistant. Now, remember, insulin resistance is this term we've been using to describe people when they get obese and they become kind of pre-diabetic. And so it's very common when you get obese that your blood sugars, which we call blood glucose, tend to start going up. So normally you keep your blood glucose under 100 most of the time, especially when you're fasting. 
and it'll start drifting up when you become insulin resistant. And then when it gets real high, it becomes diabetes. And that's like a bad thing because yeah. diabetes causes eye disease and heart disease and kidney disease. So everyone's kind of worried about insulin resistance because it seems to be the precursor or the prelude to developing diabetes. And so, you know, a lot of us have continuous glucose monitors, even if we're not diabetic, because we want to know what foods make us, you know, take the glucose up. And there's this thought that when the glucose goes up, that it stimulates insulin and fat. So maybe we need to keep our glucose levels low. And there's lots of people on low carb diets and so forth, because carbs are the main thing that drive glucose up. But these animals become insulin resistant. And it turns out that insulin resistance is also a survival benefit. So fat is a survival benefit if you don't have food. But if you don't have food, you also need to make sure you get adequate fuel to the brain. Because if you can't think, you're not going to do well. And so the brain uh, prefers uh, glucose as its fuel normally. And interestingly, it doesn't really need insulin for the glucose to work there. So in order for glucose to get into tissues, many tissues need insulin. So if you want to get glucose into your muscle, you have to have insulin around. And then the insulin moves the glucose into the muscle and that gives you fuel. But if you become insulin resistant, then less glucose can go into the muscle. So there's more to go to the brain. So it's basically a way to shunt the glucose, so that more of it goes to the brain than to the muscle, which is what you want to do if you don't have enough food. So insulin resistance turns out to be, you know, a good guy at this stage. You don't want, I mean, we don't really want it because we have food 24 hours, seven. We don't have, so we our problem is not food scarcity, scarcity right? right? Our food is, our problem is food abundance, not scarcity. Yeah, Absolutely. we don't want, yeah. yeah, totally right, Kevin. We don't want to be insulin resistant, but if you're in the wild, it is. And so what's happened is we've carried over these survival things and we've learned how to turn on leptin resistance and we've turned, learned how, you know, we're eating too much and we're exercising too little, but we're also triggering a switch, a, like a biologic switch that is preparing us for food shortage, but we're not, there is no food shortage. And so it turns out that this switch involves a lot of other things, it isn't just putting on fat and insulin resistance, but our blood pressure goes up to help us survive by keeping our circulation strong. And there's fat that goes up in our blood and in our liver because that's another source for calories. And, you know, there's a lot of things that go on. We start foraging. You know, one interesting thing about energy balance, which I know that you really like energy balance, is that when you trigger this switch, you can still maintain a fair amount of energy while you're foraging for food. So when you're active, your energy is actually maintained. So where the energy drops is when you're resting. And so resting energy metabolism decreases with the switch. So animals will tend to, like if you induce the switch in mice, they'll get really, really fat and they'll be inactive and kind of just sit there and not move much when they're not, I mean, when they're not doing things. But if you get them to run, they'll still run. It's just that they don't want to lose their ability to forage for food. So they maintain their metabolism for that, but they do want to rest more and lower their heart rates and everything to slow their metabolism when they're not foraging for food. This way they can reduce their energy needs, but they still can find the food if they need it. That's a, let's pick this apart for just a minute here, because what I hear you saying is that ancestrally for people or, or in animals, we might see that there's this survival switch, which has these survivability benefits, right? And for ancient humans, that would have been a very important part of survivability for us. And what you're saying is, is that it would be preferable for my body to store fat and for my metabolic rate to be lower, right? Uh, right. So I'm not burning so much calories at rest. But it seems to me that now, today, given our 
exact opposite environment, right? We, right. Don't, I don't need to forage for food. I don't need to go to a long trek to hunt something or to get these berries that are in season, you know, a yeah. hundred miles over there that I have to go there in that month to go get those things. Instead, I can have DoorDash bring food right to me and I can just exactly. sit on my couch and I can Netflix. So it seems like these survivability mechanisms that you're describing, these biological survivability mechanisms are now working against me because what I really want yes. now is is not to store fat and for my resting metabolic rate to be higher. I want to, it would be more beneficial Absolutely to me for it to be higher. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, you've got it a hundred percent correct. So what happened was this was a very basic survival mechanism that's ingrained in us and actually was helpful to us in the past. In fact, we are more sensitive to this switch than others because of, of things that happened in our past. So we, we have learned how to survive, but now we're in trouble. And the, the question is, you know, what, what activated the switch? What activates the switch? And, and our work linked us with sugar, but not any kind of sugar, particular sugar called fructose. So fructose is the sugar in honey, it's the sugar in natural fruits, which is disappointing because, you know, we know that, well, we, natural fruits are, are basically healthy. We know they're healthy, but yet uh, fructose in it is, is, can activate this survival switch. And, but fructose, the main source of fructose today is not from fruit. It's from sugar, table sugar. Table sugar has fructose and glucose. It's called sucrose, but it's half of it is fructose. And high fructose corn syrup is another one that has fructose and glucose mixed. And these added sugars are the main source of dietary fructose. And when you give fructose to animals, they develop uh, this switch. It activates the switch. And it turns out that that's also, you know, how hibernating animals, a lot of them will use fruit as a way to become fat. But they don't eat a couple fruit like like we do, they eat hundreds of fruits. They're going to gorge. Yeah. They're going to gorge on it. They'll, you know, they eat thousands of berries uh, in a day. A bear will, or the um, orangutan will eat a hundred mango like fruit, you know, at one setting. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. So they, and, and when they eat that much sugar, it activates the switch. And we figured out how that works. And the switch uh, works by uh, working on the energy factories. So the energy factories that we are, what makes our energy, it's these things called mitochondria. And everybody has mitochondria and they're making ATP is, the, is what we call the currency for energy. So when you are lifting weights, when you're running, you're burning ATP. This is the energy we need. And when you're thinking, when we're thinking, we use ATP. ATP is used for a lot of things. It's, it's our energy. But there's two types of energy, really. There's the energy we're using from moment to moment, and there's the energy we store. And when we store energy, it's fat or glycogen. You know, fat is the main energy source that we store, but glycogen is sort of like starch from animals. It's kind of the stored carbohydrate. And both of those can be uh, turned into energy. So when we store glycogen and fat, we're storing energy. Otherwise, we have ATP to, as our active energy. And the way that you know, the mitochondria usually make ATP, and you know there is some fat being made in the body, of course, but uh, the energy factories tend to use the, the the caloric source to make ATP. And what happens is when you eat fructose, it's it's like puts a little oxidative stress on those mitochondria, a little stress on them and makes them not work as well. And so they make less ATP. So there's more calories that can then go to fat. So it kind of shifts the body from making energy to storing energy. So it's this brilliant system to have you store fat. And then what, what happens is when it reduces the energy you're producing, that actually makes you hungry to get more. So you eat more food and that triggers the leptin resistance and the whole thing. So you end up eating more and producing 
less ATP and more fat. And so the calories are preferentially going to fat. So that that's how it works. And so it's a brilliant system. And initially it's very reversible. So you just cut back on the sugar and you can, you know, everything will go back to normal. And you probably noticed that when you first were gaining weight, if you were one who gained weight, some people never gain weight, but if you start getting fat in the beginning, it was like really easy. You just, you know, it was just reduce your food and take a little bit, exercise a little more and it would go away. But eventually what happened is it became harder and harder to do that. And what happens is over time, these mitochondria get continued, you know, they're being recurrently damaged. And so over time they start to, break up or they do a thing called fission and they get smaller and they become less effective. And then you start losing mitochondria. And then as that happens, you can't make as much energy, even chronic, you know, even when the switch isn't turned on. And so then you kind of like reset your weight to a, a higher weight. And then it's really hard to lose weight because if you lose weight, you, you the, your body thinks that your, your weight should be this, new higher weight that you move to because that's what you know you kind of set yourself to that so you kind of get locked into that higher weight and so although you exercise and you lose weight you tend to want to go back and the good news is you can if you can stimulate the mitoc if you can stop stop the switch you know stop that switch from being turned on and then you work on the mitochondria to try to get them to increase in number, you can actually kind of, it's like reversing aging, sort of. You, you're going to give yourself more energy. You're going to, it's going to be easier to lose weight and keep it off. You'll be able to eat more at meals without gaining weight. I mean, it's really the way to go. And, and the incredible thing, and Kevin, I think you really promote this, is the power of exercise. And exercise, everyone should have a trainer, I think. I want one. <laughs> but you know, you really need to have someone there to help you exercise to improve, you know, your mitochondria. It's not about burning calories. You don't burn right. that. No, I, I'm with you. Yeah. I think a lot of people have that mistaken, especially these cardio folks, because that's a common prescription, right? I'll, I'll do less and I'll, I'll run or I'll bike or I'll yeah, get on the yeah. treadmill. And back to what you were just saying a minute ago, what happens is, Let's say I'm a female and I, now I'm down to 1,500 calories a day and I'm jogging four days a week and I lose a few pounds, but then that plateaus. So what do I do? Well, I start running a couple more days a week and I cut my calories down to 1,200 uh, calories a day. And all of a sudden, kind of, I think what you were alluding to there is we're now metabolically adapting. The body's very, very resilient, very good at finding the stasis. And so the body's saying, okay, this is the work we have to do. And these are calories we have to do. Let me pare down some muscle. We don't, we don't need that. That's metabolically expensive. <laughs> this person has now become metabolically adapted to this workload in this nutrient load. And that's very unhealthy because there's nowhere for her to go, right? Is she going right. to, is, is does the next cut come? And so she's her body is back to the survivability switch is desperately trying to shunt any yes. extra calories to store as fat as I, I think that's what's happening. And what you're saying, as opposed to, you know, trying to fix this with the diet, because that's kind of that contributed to what broke this particular hypothetical person. What we really want to do is concentrate on restoring that metabolic health, right? How do we, how do we get our mitochondria and healthier and increase our ATP factories to do what they're supposed to do. Is that a fair way of describing that? Well, I, 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 almost, absolutely. But I, I want to just make one minor thing. So there's, sure. there's really two major, two major things. One is we need to know how to turn off this switch that makes us want to eat more and, and get fat. And so we need to know how to do that. And then we need to restore our mitochondria. Yes. And you need to do both. Because if you're trying to restore the mitochondria, but you're still eating sugar, you're going to be in trouble, right? But if you're you know, doing things to restore the mitochondria, I mean, if you just modify diet, that's not going to be enough. So, but the, you know, the big surprise and which you'll see in the book is that it isn't just sugar that activates the switch, you know? I was a doctor who studied sugar. I'm probably 
you know, I am an expert on fructose. I mean, I've been studying it for 20 plus years and published how it works. And, you know, I, I know fructose very, very well. And I, and in the beginning, I was thinking it was all the sugar we were eating and the high fructose corn syrup that's being put in all these processed foods. And it is a lot of it. But what we discovered is that the body can make fructose. You don't just have to eat it. And this, I mean, it was known that that the body could make fructose, but no one thought that the, the fructose we make could make us obese. But it turns out that we can make fructose from certain foods. So it isn't just sugar. It isn't just high fructose corn syrup. It's things like high glycemic carbs. It's the potatoes we eat. Because when you eat those potatoes and the sugar, the blood sugar, go, blood glucose goes up, it triggers the production of fructose in the body in addition to, you know, stimulating insulin and all these things. And it turns out that fructose is, is stimulate that, that high glycemic carbs like potatoes, rice, crackers, cereal, bread. They are another major source that can trigger this survival switch. And the other thing is that this is surprising, but mild dehydration is another major way yeah. to stimulate sugar production, or fructose production in the body. And, and it turns out that, you know, one way you can get dehydrated is not drinking enough water. And, but the other way is to eat salt. When you eat salt, you actually create a kind of a type of dehydration. And that also seems to generate fructose in the body. It's a slower process. It's not like you're going to eat salt and become overweight super fast. But in animals, it takes about twice as long as it does for sugar. So sugar is like the, the king, king penguin. It's the one that really drives obesity. But you can do it with, like, with high salty foods without sugar. Just giving salty foods will do it, but it takes a longer time. So anyway, so when we learned this, so, so the, the book talks about the different kinds of foods that activate the switch, foods that don't, and then how to uh, repair those mitochondria, which uh, is really where exercise has its greatest role. It's not to burn calories as much right. as it is, is to increase our ability to produce energy. And exercise is the best approach. And it's certain types of exercise, right? It's more like this zone two exercise. Yeah, I think I have found that, and there, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Dr. Gabriel Lyon. She's really big on the muscle centric medicine front. And one thing she says quite often is we have less of a problem, less of a health problem with being overly fat than we do with being underly muscled. And this specifically, she's speaking to aging population. And yeah. to her point, you know, is that that type two muscle fiber is very metabolically expensive and we lose it preferentially over the type one muscle type fiber that you might find in say somebody who does very healthy things like going for walks and bike rides and things that they should be doing. But when we lose that, uh, when we stop strength training and doing some sort of resistance training as especially as we age we lose these type 2 muscle fibers that i think go a long way towards this metabolic health that you're talking about oh, right this absolutely. restoring of the of, yeah 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 i would agree with her and the other thing that's you know i'm so currently i'm studying muscle wasting and especially in kidney disease but muscle wasting is also a problem as we get older yep and it turns out that this, this switch has a role in muscle wasting. It's slightly different switch, but it's, it's very, very, it's the same principle. And it actually insulin resistance seems to be playing a role in muscle wasting, especially in the kidney patients with kidney disease. And so we've got to do everything to try to keep muscle strong. And all those things that you're talking about are ways to go. But also we do need to block this switch that can lead to insulin resistance and so forth. So insulin resistance is bad for muscle and it's bad for uh, obesity is bad primarily because of the insulin resistance effects on making the muscle uh, smaller. So if you, if you take an animal, for example, there's a mouse that doesn't respond to leptin. You know, we talked about leptin as being this hormone that controls satiety. When you knock out leptin, these animals become huge. They become really fat. 
but they but not only do they become fat, but their muscle becomes actually de- it decreases compared to what a normal mouse has. So even though they have all this extra weight to carry, their muscle doesn't actually in, increase appropriately. So it's a really interesting thing. And, and the question is, you know, what's driving it? And part of it is a lack of exercise, but part of it is inflammation. And the, the, this process, this switch kind of turns on low-grade inflammation and inflammation turns out not to be good for muscle health. So one of the things that we found was the power of hydration. For most people, you know, you can drink a fair amount of water and the body will just excrete it. I mean, anyone can overhydrate if you drink like gallons. But if you drink like uh, eight to 10 glasses of water a day, that's easily handled by the vast majority of people. And what's really interesting is I mentioned that dehydration is involved in high, in obesity. And there are some studies that show that people who are obese can be 12 times more likely to be dehydrated than a, a lean wow. person. 12 times in one study. But using some other measures, it's like two to threefold more. But it's it's just common for people who are overweight to be dehydrated. And soft drinks are dehydrating. They're not hydrating. So remember that. And so what what you need to simply do is drink more water. And in our animals, if we hydrate them, we can reduce obesity simply by giving them water. And probably you need to have like three liters of water a day might be a good number to, to aim at. But it's so simple. It is. You know, it's a simple, was, yeah, such a simple thing. It has such profound yeah. effects. I tell people, just take your body weight, cut it in half. That's how many ounces of water you should drink in a day. There, there's Wonderful. a bunch of different formulas and it's less important which one of those you go with the six yeah. to cups or the, you know, oh it's my. that you actually get some water and to your point, not soft drinks, not alcoholic drinks, not yeah. drinks. Yeah. So easy. Yeah. You such know. an easy thing to do, but we well, say, it's, I mean, we, we say it is, but why is it such a problem? You yeah. know, I have a couple of ideas about that. One is first off, you just got to make sure you have a glass of water with, at every meal. And what I find is that there's a lot of people who get a glass of water and they just let it sit there and they eat their meal and they forget about the water. So here's the rule I, I would recommend. You can't, you're not allowed to eat a bite of food until you drink that whole glass of water. Yep, there you go. Yeah. And, and that way you would you ensure that you're going to drink it. And then try to drink between meals and so forth. But every time you have a food, get a glass of water and force yourself to drink it, even if you don't want to, just it'll make you feel better. It will help you. And, and it has benefits. It has tangible benefits. We, we've published in very, very good journals. It used to be thought that hydration was kind of like a tale, the tale that people tell each other and, you know, that got into the literature as kind of a, a myth. And in fact, there was even a paper, uh, an op-ed in New York Times saying, you know, over, you know, hydrating with water is a myth. It's not a myth. You know, we've published uh, in top journals how this works, and it actually works by suppressing a hormone called vasopressin, and that's how it actually protects. And most people with obesity have elevated vasopressin, and that's a hormone that goes up with dehydration. And if you reduce that, you can reduce the risk for developing obesity and diabetes. So it's real. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm with you 100. Um, there, you know, there are a few levers that are fairly easy to make everything better in your life. Hydration clearly is one of them. Getting rid of processed and especially the ultra processed foods, yeah. absolutely oh, yeah. another one. And improving your sleep. If you just did those three oh, things, yes. you'd be so far ahead of everyone else. Now, I want to kind of tie all this together. We just talked about a, a, a whole bunch of things here, but before we do that, let's talk about the role of stress and chronic stress. We talked about this survivability switch and we talked about oxidative stress. We talked about doing mitochondrial damage. Where does stress, because let's face it, once upon a time, stress was a good thing, right? If um, our ancestors were out somewhere and a scary thing happened, we needed to be able to physically 
respond to that in either a fight or a flight, right? And today our stress is more traffic and boss and family and all these other things. And it's a chronic stress and it's no longer serving us from a health perspective. What's your take on stress and specifically with metabolic health? Well, it's a good one. I, I, I can answer this multiple ways, but basically stress can activate the switch too, to some extent. It, it actually can alter hormones and increase your risk for high blood pressure and insulin resistance. And there are all kinds of stress. So when you are searching for food because you don't have any food and you activate the switch, there is this survival uh, stress response, as you mentioned. And that survival stress response involves searching for food. And that requires you to be active. You have to be able to go out and, and into areas you've never been. So it's a little bit dangerous and you have to be bold and you have to be willing to, it's sort of like novelty seeking. You ha- can't deliberate uh, on anything very quickly because you got to find that food. So you can't like concentrate on one area. You have to like be looking in all directions at all times. And so this kind of behavioral pattern, it can be a great thing. It's, you know, you, the, the explorers, the adventurers, you know, going into the world to uh, areas unknown, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a, a positive thing to be able to have that. You have to be brave and be able to fight if you have to. I mean, it, it's sort of an, uh, you know, something that we would applause to. We see movies where we, we like these characters when they do that. But if you keep activating that pathway where you're continuously doing that, what happens is your personality starts to get locked in where you start. Now, you, you when you're looking you can't concentrate very well because you're you're like looking everywhere. We call that ADHD, you know, mm. hyperactivity and con- difficulty concentrating. And ADHD is very much linked with with obesity and with metabolic syndrome and with sugar intake. And you can create in animals, you can kind of create aspects of ADHD by chronically giving them sugar. So. It, it can be a, a can become a problem, right? So a little bit, you know, is is you're a hero a lot. You become a person who becomes enabled to really finish things and and complete things. So it, it you know it's it's kind of got a two edged sword. But stress, you know, it, it can activate this pathway as well. Actually, there's this really interesting thing that even stress within our body can lead to activation of this pathway just at that site. So for example, there's a group in Germany that showed that when you're, when you have a heart attack, animals have a, if they create a heart attack in an animal, the, the heart doesn't get enough oxygen and the part of the heart dies. And you know what happens in the heart? It starts to make fructose. And the fructose has been found to actually drive inflammation and things in the heart, which was meant as a survival response, but actually can lead to cardiac hypertrophy. And what they found in this book was that, I mean, in their paper was that if they could block the fructose, they could preserve the heart better. So this kind of hyperactive stress and the fact that we're eating all this sugar and there's a lot of fructose you know, if you're in that setting, that environment where there's a lot of fructose around and you induce this production of fructose, you get this exuberant production and and it's actually can be associated with local heart disease. So stress, stress can activate <laughs> fructose in the heart even, you know. So, you, you know, so stress turns out no one wants stress, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I, no one yeah, wants that- there's a cascade, a cascade of negative effects that comes from especially chronic stress, right? Obviously, our bodies were designed to have a stress response for survivability, but much like the nutrition stuff we talked about, most of us don't need that in our day to day life, and that's not where our stress is coming from. And, it's not yeah. from a, a physical threat to our to ourselves. And, and, yeah, and you know, uh, eating well, sleeping well, doing an exercise pattern. When I, you know, I'm a physician who is a workaholic. Kevin, my biggest problem with me 
is that I'm a total workaholic. I've, you know, written hundreds of papers and I tend to get up early and work late. And I get so excited about research that sometimes I forget to exercise. And when I forget to exercise, it, it catches up with me and I don't feel good. And as soon as I exercise on a daily basis, I go back into being less stressed and feeling happier, more healthy, sleep better. So I, I actually think exercise is really like critical. And I tend, just because of my my enthusiasm to, to study and to do research and write, you know, it's always a battle for me, but I'm always happier when I'm exercising. You'll be good. To, you'll, you'll like to know, Kevin, I'm going to exercise this afternoon. I will like to know that. And I would submit to you that keeping up with a regular exercise regimen makes you a better everything, including a researcher and a co-worker oh, and a, just an everything, right? That, for that sure. practice of self-care. And it's more that not just exercise, but it's that holistic practice of self-care yes. that just makes you show up in life as your best, most passionate self. And I just want to highlight what you mentioned there a minute ago. I, as a coach, I get a lot of people that come to me primarily for fat loss, and they don't even put it in those terms. It's weight loss, right? And there are a certain subset of those people that will just be obsessed on the scale. If the scale said this, then I would be happy. But what you just described were all these amazing benefits of eating well and taking care of yourself and exercising and sleep and all of these things that had nothing to do with the scale, really, right? I feel better. I have my moods increased. My libido's right. increased. I have more energy. And right. just all, all of these things are a benefit of oh, yeah. eating well, exercising, right? I, anyway, I'm getting off on no, no, tangent. You're totally right. That's my jam right we, there. We shouldn't focus on fat. We should focus on health. There you go. And, yeah, uh, that is yeah. very, very well said. So- all right, Rick, let's let's start to tie this together here. We've talked a lot about the survivability switch, and one of the main culprits is this fructose, and we now know that it's in most of the food that we eat, most of the processed food. You mentioned also that it's it's common in things like honey and fruit. What should we eat? What is our prescription for healthy eating, given all of this information? How do we distill well, it and apply it? Well, the very first thing is avoid sugary beverages. Because when you drink a sugary beverage, you get a very high concentration of sugar in a very short period of time. Everyone drinks the soft drink fast. Everyone, you know, if you eat, if you drink soft drinks or, or sugary beverages, you, you're likely to get a high load of sugar. And that will activate this switch because it's driven by the concentration, not just the amount. So if you drink, drink it a lot fast, you get a huge concentration. The second thing is uh, fruit juices, is, you know, our sweet sugary beverages and consider them as dangerous. Consider them as dangerous. Dried fruit also is pretty much just sugar because they, they get rid of all the good things in fruit when you dry them. A lot of them, a lot of them are removed. So view dried fruit as candy. And then you know, when it comes to natural fruits, it's actually fine and good, and it's actually healthy. And, and it, there's not a lot of fructose in a single fruit. I recommend eating like one fruit at a time, you know, and, and, but, but have like three, four fruits a day. And uh, that way, you're not giving yourself a large load of fructose. You're just eating like five or six grams compared to like 30 grams in a soft drink. And, and it turns out that the body neutralizes about four or five grams of fructose every time you eat it. The intestine removes about four or five grams without letting activate the switch. So if you just eat a regular fruit, it's not going to activate the switch. And we've, and it has all the good things, you know, vitamin C, flavanols, and it helps if you do have that sweet craving, it will help satisfy that. And, uh, and, you know, so, and then, you know, really watch the high glycemic carbs. You know, if you are on a low carb diet, all the more power to you. If you're on a keto diet, that's great. But, you know, uh, the truth is high glycemic carbs are are super uh, dangerous, like bread, rice, potatoes. But, you know, everybody, there's so many people who can't live without them. So, you know, you, you, you know, you have to kind of gauge yourself. If you want, you know, want to be on a low carb diet, great. If you don't, you just reduce 
those carbs is, you know, pretty significantly, the high glycemic carbs, get a continuous glucose monitor measured. You know, another thing is fats. Well, they're, you know, they're good fats and bad fats, right? So omega-3 fatty acids tend to be good. They, they like fish oil and stuff like that. They tend to block the effects of fructose. So like a study in the brain showed it could block the effects of fructose, which was causing confusion to these poor mice. You know, omega-6, probably I would not eat very much of that. There's evidence they're inflammatory. There's some people who believe it's a big cause of obesity, although that's not uh, likely based on our research. But I don't like omega-6, so I kind of agree with the big, the general idea not to eat a lot of that. Saturated fats, you know, try to keep maybe 10% of your diet of saturated fats. You can, you know, the saturated fats are really the only kinds of fats that can cause a little bit of weight gain in the absence of carbohydrates. But, 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 you know, saturated fats are good too. I like saturated fats. I, I mean, I love butter, things like that. But, but yet you do have to watch your cholesterol. And if you're, if your cholesterol is really high, you may need to, you know, watch how much saturated fat you're eating. Anyway, I go into all this. There's a lot of this is no surprise. There are foods called umami foods, which are these really delicious <laughs> foods. A lot of meats have umami. Uh, beer has umami. Things that are really high in umami are can activate the switch too. And so like beer, it turns out it isn't really the alcohol. It does is partly the alcohol, but it's the yeast. Uh, the brewer's yeast, and it will cause obesity just like sugar. Beer is no different from sugar in its ability to cause obesity. Whereas uh, wine is a little bit less, but it you know still can activate it a little bit because of alcohol. A soft, I mean, the hard liquors, you know, often mixed with sugary drinks. You got to be really careful with hard liquor. Dairy, there's you know there's so many some people who hate dairy. The data that I've seen, I haven't studied dairy, but the data I've seen on it is generally favorable for dairy. And there's some evidence that, you know, milk is good. And, and, you know, I realize not everybody feels that way. But I, you know, in my book, I explain why I think this and and so forth. But yeah, and water. That's right. Yeah. Water is super important and reducing salt is important. But, but, Increasing water and reducing salt kind of go together. So, so th- those are kind of like the general principles. Coffee turns out to be very healthy. I know people don't believe as long it. as you're not dumping sugar in it. I suppose. Yeah, right? you're not <laughs> dumping sugar. And, you know, some yeah. people will get a, a blood pressure may go up with coffee, is but if you're not a big drink drink a coffee drinker, but people who drink a lot of coffee, they become they they lose that that blood pressure response to coffee. So they. They don't get that rise in blood pressure with coffee. I, I'm a coffee drinker because I'm a doctor who spends a long time at work. And and so I love coffee and I know it does not affect my blood pressure. Okay. So there you have it, folks. And if you want the if you want all the details, the book is Nature Wants Us to Be Fat, The Surprising Science Behind Why We Gain Weight and How We Can Prevent and Reverse It. So that's that is out now, is that correct? People yes, go to Amazon and grab that. Great. Fantastic. All right. Well, I also have a website if you guys want. It's it's called drrichardjohnson.com, drrichardjohnson.com. And it has a lot, lots of little tidbits in there too. And folks, I'll make sure I get all of that into the show notes for this so you can find that there. Well, Rick, as we're wrapping up today, what's what's next for you? What's on the horizon? Well, I mean, I'm continuing to do research one of the areas we're interested in is the role of this pathway in aging and also the role of this pathway in dementia. So I'm, I'm very interested in pursuing more research in this area. We also think it could be involved in a disease in pregnancy called preeclampsia. And so there's a number of, of additional areas that I want to study. And so I'm keeping myself busy. <laughs> All right. And then folks, if they want to connect with you, you've already given the the website, this Dr. Richard Johnson, right? Dr. Richard Johnson.com. And are you also on any social media platforms? Do you have a Facebook presence? Yes, or? I do have an Instagram and Twitter accounts. 
So the Instagram is Richard J. Johnson. Or no, I'm sorry. It's Dr. Richard J. Johnson. And my Twitter account, I'll have to give you the information. <laughs> okay, no worries. I'll get all that. And again, folks, you can find that in the show notes to this. So you can look for that there. And then, Rick, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing not only your wisdom and your knowledge, but obviously you're so passionate about this. Thank you for sharing your passion for this subject. And I just encourage you to keep up the great work. Thank you. And Kevin, you're quite passionate, too. I really appreciate what you're doing (laughs) and trying to improve and help people with their health. Thank you. Okay, folks, that's our show for this week. I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. You can find all of the links to the resources we discussed in this episode over at silveredgefitness.com slash episode 111. And you can continue the conversation over there as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments on today's show. As we wrap up our time together today, you can show your support for this show in two important ways. The first is to tell a friend about this podcast and encourage them to give it a listen. The second is to give this podcast a five-star review on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on and be sure to subscribe and follow so you don't miss any future episodes. I also want to let you know that if you've enjoyed this podcast, I have other free resources over at silveredgefree.com. There you'll find guides with my top tips on exercise, nutrition, and lifestyle. So feel free to head over there and download anything that looks useful to you and your health and wellness journey. I really appreciate you spending your time with me today. And until next time, stay strong.